Hey guys, it's Ken McElroy here, and I'm here with my good friend Patrick Donahoe at Paradigm Life. Hey, Patrick. What's up, Kenny? How you doing? How are you? What's good. happening? You know, just uh, hanging out. I was looking forward to uh, to our our back and forth today. It's gonna be awesome. I know, I know. So, what you guys do, uh, Patrick's his his company does wealth management, insurance products, financial planning, estates, all that kind of stuff for, for high net worth people. And um, so we get into all these great discussions. But what I really like, and what we the last discussion we got into, is right up his alley. He's a massive student around currency and inflation going way back. And uh, so I'm excited to talk about this. You know, let's let's jump right in about currency and inflation. I know the last time we talked, uh, a lot of people, you know, may or may not know about the Bretton Woods Agreement and how the dollar's not really backed by gold. I know if they listen to Kiyosaki once, you know, they, you know, but, uh, you know, why, why does the U.S. need to be a mass importer and a consumer, not an exporter of goods? And let's get into all that, because I think um, once you start to understand it from a bigger picture, uh, then hopefully you can start to make some really good decisions around the devaluation of the dollar and around inflation. Because if you understand just those two things, which candidly, uh, you know, it, they don't really teach very well, I don't think, in, in school. Uh, you know, but if you can understand those, then just that, just that will help you set you up over the long haul, right? Let, so let's jump right in about Britain Woods and kind of where you think everything's heading right now. Well, it's a man, this is such a it's a deep discussion and there are lots of uh, opinions out there. At the same time, you know, I I look at just where we're at as a as a country uh, coming off of one uh, president going into another with very different agendas, like almost polar opposite agendas. Plus, you're coming off of, you know, the coronavirus. You know, I, I look at where we stand right now, and there is a great power that we have as a country by having uh, the world's reserve currency, right? The majority of the world's like 90% settles their accounts uh, with the dollar. And so I look at, you know, what you just posed as the question as far as, you know, us exporting our consumerism, right? We're exporting we're, our purchasing, right? We're buying stuff. And most of that stuff uh, is produced overseas, right? So if we're buying stuff from China, we're using our dollars and they're sending us their stuff, some good quality, some not so good quality, right? And right now, you know, we buy a lot of Chinese goods. We buy a lot of other, you know, countries' goods as well. Uh, and we send them our, our dollars in exchange for that, for that stuff. Uh, and we don't export uh, as much, right? We carry a pretty hefty uh, trade deficit. And, and that's a good thing because their economies rely on our purchasing, Okay. And as we purchase more and more, it's kind of like we're in this, you know, Chinese finger puzzle where, you know, we're, neither of us can uh, get out. Now, I think that there's, you know, there's a lot of efforts by China with its, you know, Belt and Road uh, initiative where they're trying to, you know, export their influence and capital. So instead of buying, you know, U.S. Uh, US treasuries and securities, Right. They're investing in other countries. Right. And creating agreements there, which I think is really interesting. Uh, but, you know, we still hold a lot of a lot of cards. Right. As a as a nation, not just with our consumerism, but, you know, our our military as well. And we also export a lot of pretty valuable things. I mean, our intellectual property exports are, you know, desirable uh, Our you know, we export you know, a lot of automobile stuff, technology, planes, like most of the world's planes are, you know, made up in your home state, right? So it's one of those like, you know, we offer a, a lot, but this kind of positions us to maintain that, uh, that power, even though a lot of countries don't like it. Yeah, it's crazy. It's interesting, you know, with this, uh, people are hurting right now. There's no question, you know, and they need money. They, they, there's no businesses need money. People need money. Uh, you know, they can't pay their mortgages. They can't pay their rents. So, and one of the things on the table is this minimum wage. It, as you know, it's basically going to double. And so I always tell everybody, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, it, people don't need it. I think trying to live on seven or $8 an hour minimum wage, minimum wage has got to be very, very, very hard. But um, that just pushes this 
this whole issue uh, further, further apart, because that means that we can't, you know, the reason we ex or the reason we import those goods is because they're produced at so cheap. And and uh, there's no way that we can do that. And so this this minimum wage issue is just going to push things further and further apart. Would, would you agree with that? I do. Yeah, because it's, you know, in, in the end, it's like the money has to come from somewhere, right? Whether it's the minimum wage or whether it's uh, forgiving student loans uh, or it's giving, a, you know, another a two thousand dollar check right? As a COVID-19 relief, the money, it's not free, right? The money comes, comes from somewhere. So I would say from a minimum wage standpoint, that comes directly from a business owner. And it's not just the $15, right? There's social security on top of it. There's training on top of it, right? There's workers' compensation on top of it. So it's more expensive than $20 or $15 an hour, probably more like 20 bucks or more per hour. So what's going to happen is, you know, there. <laughs> Either employers are going to raise their prices uh, or they're going to try to squeeze more out of the staff they currently have, right? There's, it sounds good up front and I understand why people are intrigued by it. And I agree with your, your point, right? It's not possible to live right off of seven, $8 uh, an hour, $9 an hour, an hour. So I understand why a simple fix of $15 an hour, that should solve it. But it's not maybe initially for a year or so, but not in the long run. I think it actually hurts people, right? Because yeah, there it's not the right solution, right? The right solution is, is finding ways to be more valuable, right? But usually people aren't able to discover that uh, unless they are, you know, in, in this position where they're not making enough, enough money. But I think we're conditioning, you know, citizens, especially if like students think about students that just get $50,000 waived, they get this bonus paid, you know, this uh, unemployment benefits, they get stimulus checks. I mean, I understand why at the same time, if you think about human behavior, they get conditioned, right. As that's the solution, not I'm the solution. It's like some external force needs to solve my problems for me. And I think there's a, you know, there's, there's instances where certain people definitely need uh, help. They need uh, relief. Yeah, at the same time, there are many that are can do just fine without the relief, but are getting it, which subsequently creates that conditioning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could give a man a fish, or you can give him money to buy a fish. <laughs> right. Uh, so let's. Let's jump in real quick. You know, obviously we just came out of this CARES Act and poured a bunch of cash into the economy and in the form of PPE and PPP and EIDL and all those kinds of things, that, uh, uh, unemployment and, you, you know, things that people needed for sure. Now, of course, we're right on the verge of another almost $2 trillion. Uh, and, and um, you know, now I think we're somewhere around $7 trillion or something like that, uh, pretty close to that. Six and I think like six and a half, six and three quarters. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So can you walk through, cause I know you're a big student of, of economics and I mean, we, we you and I talk a lot about this. Can you walk through, well, we eat, when you dump that kind of money into an economy, which is happening basically in a 12 month period, can you talk about what the short term and the long term implications could be potentially based on history, not based on, you know, what I mean, because one's a guess. The other one is go back to history and, and kind of look at it because, you, you know, I know you go way back Ottoman Empire, Roman Empire. We've talked about all this stuff about how these fiat currencies have basically gone basically to zero. And, and even in the U.S., uh, that's happened, uh, you know, with with the U.S. has had more than just the dollar we have at the moment moment. But uh, let, let's talk through that now. And, and what do you see in the short term and the long term? Well, I'll, I'll use short term history first. Well, I mean, you, you mentioned Bretton Woods in, in the beginning. I think the big piece there is, you know, when the, the gold standard was essentially a check, right? So that we couldn't do what we're doing right now. In order to create more money supply, you had to have a ratio to gold. Uh, right now, there is no it's completely fiat. It's it's a complete flexible monetary system, which means they can print as much as they want. And I think the modern technology, because it's all digital, makes it a lot easier to expand and, and contract. But I look at, you know, I look at recent history, 
and you well let's let's first look at what the intention is right why are they why are they printing that much money why is that much stimulus going into the economy well businesses can't pay their payroll okay you know people don't have and they're still unemployed uh you have you know just a lot of disruption to the economy i mean G- gdp is obviously up in the fourth quarter right but you had huge disruption to that and so this money is meant to you know supplement right it's meant to be a short term fix a band a bandaid um and it, you know i think it's doing that to an extent uh, but it's not creating the growth that the U.S. wants. The last thing the U.S. needs right now is deflation, right? Because if the if GDP, right, the overall you know production of the economy goes down, that's not good. That's not good at all. Uh, and right now, you know, I think if, if you look at you know the most recent stimulus last year, right, there there wasn't much consumption. Right. The intention was that the money would be injected into the, co- the economy and people would spend. But they didn't. They paid down debt and, you know, save the money <laughs> or put it into, you know, GameStop call options. Yeah. You know, but there's, you know, this this idea that you print money and it creates stimulus. That's a uh, John Maynard Keynes was famous for that, you know, ratio. You put one dollar into the economy and it'll create, you know, the ideal dollar 35 or something like that. But in the long run, it's never worked, right? There's countries that you can show throughout history that have tried to do this. They have tried to, you know, deflate their currency in the Roman Empire. They clipped their coins, right? Melted them down and made new coins. (laughs) They clipped the edges of the coins. Most people don't know that the edges of your coin, the reason why there's all those slits in there, right? Is so it proves if somebody's trying to clip the edges, but you know, our coins obviously are not made with valuable metals anymore. anymore right? but they were, <laughs> but they were back in the, you know, back, back in the, back in the day. But the idea is that when government, when governments do this, there's, there's a tipping point, right? And we're in unprecedented times because of technology, right? But also because of how big our uh, economy is. It's a global uh, economy and all monetary policies and central banks are all kind of interwoven. So you can look at history and see signals and flags, okay? But that was applied to a specific economy then. We live in different, it's a different type of economy where the world is is connected. But you know, there's, there's so much evidence that there's just, there's not gonna be continued inflation right? It's going to be really difficult to create more and more growth, which ultimately will lead to uh, deflation. And I think technology is putting a ton of deflationary pressure uh, out there. And, you know, I think in our, in, in our lifetime, we're going to see sustenance levels at all-time lows just because of how, uh, you know, these tech companies and startups are capitalized. But what they're doing is they're making life cheaper, right? They're making our lifestyle way less expensive. Uh, and I think that trend is going to continue. So when that crosses, right, when they're printing and trying to stimulate but not getting growth, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Okay, so Patrick, I know you were talking about, you know, technology and how everything has become deflationary on that side because I read a lot about this too. Like everybody wants that, right? Like when you buy a $1000 iPhone, like in a, in a couple of years it's worth 4 or 500 bucks or something. And that's what we're talking about. And and also computers and all these things they're getting better and better and better and better and better and prices are going down. So that's deflationary. You, you know, that's basically making something better and it's and it's less. Even cars, you know, you know, if you go back and take a look, you know, cars are, are, are cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and and uh, more efficient using technology, using AI. Um, and the government is kind of fighting this, you know, obviously. Right. They don't want deflation. Can you can you talk about why? Yeah. And I'd love to hear your thoughts, your thoughts as well, because uh, I've always learned way more from you than you learn from me, it seems like. Uh, but, you know, the the idea behind stimulus Right. And right now, again, we're in unprecedented times because there's twenty seven trillion dollars right, of, of debt that we have, let alone some of the promised benefits that we have with Social Security and, and Medicare. I mean, it's an exorbitant amount of money and it keeps going up, Okay, which that just simple reasoning is we need more money to pay for that. And so the way in which we get more money is usually by uh, taxes. 
right? So the idea is that you create, you know, inflation, which is more production, which creates more taxes, which then pays down the debt. That's the, that's the theory. And I just, I don't think it's sustainable. I don't think it's possible, but in the end, that's really where the government uh, is trying to continue to push things is there's big obligations out there, right? Trillions and trillions of obligations. The only way in which they're going to pay the interest on it, right? Let alone the principal, right, is to continue to bring in tax revenue, more and more tax revenue, which means that they need more growth or same growth and higher taxes. But that, <laughs> man, that, that's a slippery slope. So I asked Andy Tanner this question and he said it to me the most perfect way. He said, he goes over, you know, basically we've taken a balloon and it's gone bigger and bigger and bigger and it's inflated. So we have this balloon and right now there's holes in it. And so there is deflation happening, actually, but we're pumping so much more air in it that the balloon's kind of keeping its shape, even getting bigger, maybe a little bit smaller from time to time. But it's gotten to this size. So there's definitely things that are deflating. But overall, we've got this inflation and this. I'll tell you this, you know, what we just went through in this last year I'm just, my mind is completely blown. I never thought I would see this. And, and so I'm wondering, like, that has to turn into, you know, these high inflationary rates. When I was a kid, I remember these. You know, I remember the lines uh, for gas. I remember, you know, 15, 20% in interest rates, you know, and, and I was much, I was, a, you know, I was young and I, I remember my parents talking about all this stuff. So, you know, it's happened before, but people are just, I, I, somebody said to me the other day, goes, you know, inflation has been less than 2% for the last five years. What are you talking about? I'm like, dude, like you got to go back beyond that. That might be the only time you've been out of high school, but you know, and, and uh, you know, it just seems to me that we've got all this money hitting the economy and it has to devalue the dollar, doesn't it? It does. And, but at the same time, you know, where, where is in, where is inflation uh, showing up? And, and I believe it's, it's showing up with whatever can be leveraged. Right. And that's where you look at whether it's in the market, I think asset, there's been lots of asset inflation. Uh, you've seen it in, in real estate uh, and that started to push up, it started to push up rents, right? And I'd love to hear your commentary about, about that because it's not like kids are coming out of school with, with big job offers, right? And they get into these apartments and, you know, they just have excess money, you know, to pay their student loans and to, you know, to pay their, you know, pay their rent, you know, but yet rents are going up. I mean, here in, in Utah, right? It's insane. I drove you around here a couple of years ago, right? And I was showing you, here's a new apartment, here's a new apartment. It's like doubled, and it's insane. And rents just continue to get pushed up, but yet, you know, the salaries aren't going up. Compensation isn't going up. I know it. it it's it's nuts. I think. And and you know, I I I tell you what. I I I did a video the other day. I think you'll like this. What I said was, you know how like back in the old days we used to say that, you know, you know, on the balance sheet it actually shows cash as an asset, uh, debt as a liability. I said it's the opposite now. Debt is actually the asset. Cash is actually the liability because by holding cash, you know, you you literally are looking at potentially having that cash worth less. It might still be the same amount. In fact, you might have a thousand dollars, let's say, but that thousand dollars is going to buy less things. And so in your, you know, in, tangibly, it's still a thousand dollars in your pocket, but, but it buys less. And that's what we're talking about guys. And so, so you have to be careful. And one of the things that I really think uh, is going to happen, Patrick, is oddly enough, I think people are going to have to be in debt in order to get ahead because debt, you know, I, I'm, you know, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm doing loans at less than 3% fixed. And so if I can, if I can borrow hundreds of millions of dollars at let's say three and fix it and inflation creeps up, 
into the, you know some of those historical numbers that we've had. Now I'm fixed. I borrowed other people's money at three, and all of a sudden inflation could easily be past three this year or next. Well, it could be four or five. All of a sudden, I'm I'm actually using other people's money to get wealthy, but you know through inflation. And I actually here's what I think is actually going to happen. All this money that the government just threw at us, you know, call it six trillion dollars, six and a half trillion. There's there. It happened before back in World War Two and they ended up inflating the 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 debt away. So not completely, but they let the they let the inflation go up into the four and five percent range. And then all of a sudden that debt you know, the number was the same, but it was worth less. So they inflated their own debt. And so I try to wrap your head around that. So if you're, if you're on social security, you're, you got an issue. If you're on some kind of fixed income, that's a problem for you. That same thing with the government, let's say they're at six and a half trillion dollars. Well, with, with a good 10 year run of four and 5% inflation, that, that could be worth about three you know, in, 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 in a, a dollars in a decade. So, so I think you do it. I think there's a caveat though, right. With, with how you do debt, it's, it's different because, well, and correct, totally correct me if I'm wrong, but you look at, you look at debt and from an inflation standpoint, you're totally right. Because over the course of time, the, the debt becomes cheaper, right? The debt is devalued. The debt is devalued. Uh, at the same time, if there's deflation, Okay, you've positioned it so that there's no recourse, right? So they're not going to come after another project. They're not going to come after your house or your 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 car, right? You've positioned it so that you know in the event that asset prices come down, right? There's yeah. deflation. Yep. The banks are the ones that get screwed, right? Not you, because now you can go to them and re- and renegotiate without you know fear of losing other assets, right? Right. That's exactly right. That's why that's why I like doing these uh, these uh, non recourse debt deals, because you could fix your rate and then you have again, it could go either way. And, you know, you know, hopefully we never are in that situation. Uh, we haven't yet, but uh, you never know. It could be deflationary. We could be heading into a de- but deflationary the time. You know, Richard Duncan, I got I interviewed him last year. Right. And like I asked him the question, like how much, you know, how much room do we have? Like, how much can we, can we theoretically print? And his, you know, his answer was just, you know, unlimited. And I think the government is going to do everything in their power, right. To keep the game going. Right. And I don't know, MMT, the modern monetary theory, right. Has been thrown out there, which is just an indication that that's a direction they, they could go. It should be interesting if they start to forgive debt, Right where they forgive student student loan debt, uh, I think that's going to be it's going to be interesting. But I think it'll help from a growth standpoint. But you know, I I bet on all right. Who has all the cards? Who has the guns? Who makes the rules? Right, and they're the ones. Their agenda is they have to keep going into debt. They have to inflate their way out of it. And that I don't I don't see another alternative, frankly. Yeah, I would agree. So so with that. And the last question I want to ask you, you know, now you, obviously you're a wealth manager, financial planner, you, you handle this for lots of people and you manage lots and lots of money. What are some of the most important things for people to understand about inflation and their retirement? Because I think a lot of people are faced with that. You know, we kind of started with that, with Kiyosaki, having that conversation with that guy saying, you know, or the million dollars that makes 3,500, you know, at a three and a half percent a year, that's not enough to live on. So you got to eat away at your principal. So what should, what should people be doing right now or looking at right now to, you know, to make sure that all that hard work that they've been through all that, you know, you know, blood, sweat and guts, you know, that they've been through that, that is not eroded away. And they're sitting there just guilty about, you know, how they manage their money or they didn't ask the right question. So what, what, what advice would you give them? Well, there's, it, it really depends on the person, right? Cause I've, I've come across people that don't need to invest, right? They, they should stop investing. They should, you know, invest in doing stuff with their family, right? Going on vacation with their grandkids. Uh, but there, there are others where we try to use objective measurements to demonstrate where they're at and what life looks like going forward. 
right? And we include inflation factors in there. And when you show those projections, right, it's it's humbling. And so the solution we've we've come to, and again, this is not it's not for everyone. And it also could just be a stepping stone. Uh, but I I look at one of the biggest things that uh, people can just start avoiding is this notion of retiring, right? Where there's this someday where they're just going to stop producing. One of the things that we've started to do, I've, I've encouraged for several years, right, is start to find something that you love doing, right? Start producing. Number one, you don't have to do it full time. I mean, the amount of like remote jobs that exist right now that you can do from anywhere in the world, it's un- it's unbelievable. And so even if you're working 15, 20 hours a week, it's finding something that keeps you alive, keeps you producing, right? Keeps you lively. And that's going to keep up with inflation there. Uh, I The target we try to use for people is to find something that's going to be, you know, 50% of their lifestyle expenses, right? They don't have to find it tomorrow, but at least start looking for it where they can contract themselves out, where they can, you know, position themselves to be a freelancer, to do remote work here and there. Again, there's multiple benefits to that. But the second is you got to find stuff that uh, I would say aligns with uh, where the economy is. I heard a funny thing the other day where I'm like, oh man, it's come to that. But someone's like, you know, I think a great investment philosophy is just to look at what Nancy Pelosi is doing and just invest in what she's doing. (laughs) And I was like, that's actually pretty good. I was like, Oh, like, I don't want, like, that's what it's come to. Right. Where, you know, if the government is printing, if the government is going more into debt, right. There's, there's certain assets, right. That will, uh, that'll go with that tide. And so I would say that's a good, it's a good rule of thumb. And Robert, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, in one of our study groups years ago on the sum, the summit at sea that you had mentioned earlier, you know, he, he said, you know, I understand Ron Paul's claim of end the fed, but why don't you be the fed? Right. And that hit me and it really made me think right about, okay, you have this, you have principles, you have philosophy, you have this, the things should be this way, but they're not, they're this way, but they should be that way. I think we're past that point, right. Where it's going to go to the way it should be. <laughs> Yeah. It's it is what it is, and as far as how the economy is going, it's it's monetary policy to continue to expand credit, right? To continue to stimulate, uh, and I think it's going to keep it going in that direction. So it's aligning your investment philosophy, which I think in large part is debt, and a lot of people are using debt to you know leverage uh, securities, assets that can go down in value really quick, which is dangerous. Yeah. But I think from a real estate perspective. You know, it's one of the it's one of the assets that it's the staple place for business. It's the staple place for a person to live uh, more so now than ever before because of, you know, COVID COVID-19. So housing is just one of those areas where it's always gone up and it typically will go up and leverage just makes it all more all the more attractive. And so but plus the cash flow side of things, the income side of things. Right. And that's where, again, going with if you can find something that you love doing that you can do 20 hours a week, 25 hours, five hours a week. It keeps you alive, keeps you productive. Okay. But your income is going to keep rising. And then, you know, you have your, you know, other 50% of your lifestyle covered by, by cash flow, Right. And so that's kind of where, where we've settled as a, as a good benchmark. It's not like the end all be all, but it's a good benchmark to work toward as opposed to, you know, sacrificing today for, you know, a mythical 30 years at, 65 years old. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Well, Patrick, uh, again, thank you guys for um, you know, offering the, f- the listeners to get that free book. We're going to put it up at kenmacroy.com forward slash paradigm life. For those of you guys that want that, just click on the link below. And then Patrick, how, how would people get a hold of you if they had more questions? What's the best way? Um, the website that you're going to put is the uh, is the best way. There'll be an option to put your you know information in there. I also have a podcast that you've been on a few a few times. If you want to learn more about kind of the philosophy side of things, you can also just go to the uh, paradigmlife.net website. We still we still don't have paradigmlife.com. It's some Australian crystal company that refuses <laughs> to give it up. <laughs> You'll get it one day. 
So as always, Patrick, thanks for your knowledge. Thanks for your time. And uh, thanks for taking care of your clients. And uh, more importantly, thanks for being a good friend and, uh, and um, you know, uh, a student of, of, of what we're trying to deal with here. So thank you. Well, thank you, Kenny. I mean, it was years ago where I'm like, you know, where you started KenMcElroy.com and started putting your videos up there. And I mean, you have a wealth of knowledge and you've totally upped your game in the last uh, couple of years. And it's, it's so inspiring to see. So thank you thank for you. inspiring us and teaching us. <laughs> I appreciate it. I love it, man. I, I just want people, you know, uh, people are working their butts off here and they should, you know, they should have their money at the end. That's all. That's the way I, that's what I believe. So I, I believe it too. And, you know, just as much as we're in challenging times right now, I mean, there's, there's so much to be grateful for. There's so much opportunity around and it's an excite, it's exciting. Uh, but I can see, right. That there is a, there, there's a struggle that people are having, but at the same time, it's like that struggle, it can be, you can snap out of it quick. Right. And I think what you're doing, providing hope, providing ideas, providing, you know, motivation, inspiration, that's what's going to, I don't know, it could be just that one nugget, that one idea that puts a person on a totally different tra trajectory. Just a small difference. If I can make it, I will. So again, buddy, thank you, Patrick. As always, you're the best, bud. Thanks, Ken. Cheers.